This is Megan Hibbett, my business partner and quarantine partner for the last few weeks. <laughs> um, and we are excited to answer some of your Midnight Sun questions and um, just get to talk about the book a little bit. Uh, Barnes & Noble sent over a bunch of questions. So we're going to, I'm going to do my best to get through as many as we possibly can in the amount of time that we have. Uh, some of them might be a few repeats for you guys who've been tuning in a few times. So bear with us. All right, Stephanie, let's do this. Let's do it. Um, Sarah would like to know, was it emotional for you to return to the Twilight universe and finally release Midnight Sun? Um, kind of two different questions there, I think. Um, returning to Midnight Sun, I didn't really do. I kind of was always with Midnight Sun. It has been my constant companion for the last 13 years. Um, and so there wasn't like a big moment where I just was like, you know what? I'm going to write this book, and I went and sat down. It was it was ongoing. I was always doing something with it. Um, finishing it after all that time was emotional. Although, you know, it's kind of a weird thing where you're sitting there and you've like typed the last word, and you're like, oh, now what? And then the answer to that is editing, like really intensely for months and months. Usually longer than months and months, but this time we were working fast so that we could get it out to you guys because you'd waited so long. This is sort of a follow-up question. Uh, we had a similar event like this last night, um, and somebody asked uh, what the the what the day was like when we made the announcement for you. Oh well, for me, um, it was it was kind of you know surreal. And usually, I would be somewhere, but I was just at home. A lot of my family called to say, "I saw you on the TV," and I'm like, "Right, I did do that." But it had been a couple of days, and I'd forgotten already. So. Um, it was more difficult for my support team who was trying to keep my computer from or my website from crashing over and over again. Um, it was a rougher day for them. <laughs> we didn't keep it from crashing. It crashed a lot, but people but was, got it back. But we got it back and people were excited. So that was fun. Um, what was the spark for Midnight Sun? So originally a million years ago, um, I had had the thought like that the first day of of the first chapter of Twilight is really just about a girl who goes to her first day of school at a new school and uh, sees a pretty boy who's mean to her. And that's all that happens. Um, and it's, but when you think about what was going on in that scene on the other side, there was so much more. Like it was about a near mass murder and someone who wanted to kill somebody really badly and their whole life being destroyed. Um, and I'm like, wow, that would be so much more exciting from his point of view. So I decided to write that first chapter and that was the only thing I was going to do, was just the first chapter as a writing exercise and I was gonna put it online. But um, it was fun in the beginning and uh, especially those first couple chapters, there wasn't as much interaction between Bella and Edward. They were shorter pieces that where they were talking. And so it was more that I could create. So I kept writing it. Um, and then was the whole roller coaster of <laughs> what has yeah. been Midnight Sun from then on. Um, Brittany, whose fiance bought her the book. Aww. Good on you. Um, what made you want to write Midnight Sun? You sort of covered that. Yeah, I mean, it just really was about exploring the other side of the story. Um, I knew the general emotions of what Edward was feeling, um, but it wasn't like down to dialogue or, you know, a mental stream. So it was, it was, you know, to kind of see what it would look like if I had written it from his side first, which I never would have done because um, I am neither a vampire nor a boy. And it felt really like I had to write from the girl's perspective first. I, it was something I had experienced. I have been a human teenager in high school. It's been a while, but I have done it. Um, I've never been a vampire in high school and or a boy. Um, so I had to know him really, really well before I could write him. And so I, it wasn't the first step I could take. So this, uh, Casey, Casey's question sort of ties into this. Um, when you had the dream and you came out of that, whose voice was in your head first? Was it Edwards or was it Bella's? Wow. I mean, I, I guess it must have been Bella's. They were both, I wasn't in the dream experiencing it from one perspective or the other. I was in a third perspective watching, like you would watch a conversation on a TV show. So I wasn't um, hearing it from one or the other perspective. But then when I sat down to write it, it seemed 
I mean, I didn't really even think about it. So I guess I was looking at it from Bella's perspective because that's where I, what I immediately started writing down. Although I very distinctly remember watching from a third person perspective. Um, did you always, oh, this is for Maggie. Did you always have Midnight Sun written or drafted while writing Twilight? No, this all happened, what I was describing before what I, when I went back and did the first chapter, this all happened after Twilight was already released. And then what sections of Midnight Sun did you create 15 years later? If you can do so without too many spoilers, though I assume most people have read it by now. Um, well, I mean, I don't, think it, I don't think there's anything really spoilery. Um, so I had written, um, I mean, well, now hold on, let me look at this. So did I create 15 years later? So there's not like a section except for maybe the last five or six chapters that were like the last thing I wrote. And I did those in a chunk. Everything else was a progression. And so like, I know I finished the meadow in time for Mother's Day 2017, I think. And so I know that's where I was then. Um, and so a lot of the pieces were kind of done that way. Like, well, can I give this to my mother for a present? <laughs> she's hard to shop for. So she only wants me to write stuff for her. Um, so like, and it, you know, that's, but it's every, every piece has been done across the whole time period. So it wasn't like I had a big break and then nothing. And then I wrote all this last year. It's just the, maybe the last couple chapters were a final effort. <laughs> Plugging away. Yeah. Um, Adrian would like to know, uh, now that you've written and released Life and Death, Midnight Sun, and Twilight, do you think you would have written the original series differently, or do you think the original characters were exactly who they, they were meant to be? I have to go with the latter option. Um, rewriting this from looking at it from different angles, one of the things that just doesn't change, even in Life or Death, where it was a lot looser and I didn't have to follow it so exactly, um, the characters are the characters. You know, once I once one of them is born in my crazy head, they're just there and they are who they are. And that's the biggest fights I get into with movies or with editing is when someone says, well, why didn't they do this? It's like, because they would never. <laughs> are you kidding me? Edward would not say those words. Um, in my head, they're very real and they are very who they are. And that's not, never changed. So I wouldn't, I would say, no, they've, they've always been who they were. And I think sometimes people confuse Bella and Edward and Edith and Bo as maybe the same people, but you see Edith and Bo and everyone in life and death as completely fully formed different characters. Ex yes, no, 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 because while yes, they are very different, you know, there are different things about them. The core of who they are as people is the exact same. Right. And that was kind of part of the process for me, except for Charlie, you know, he had a lot of switches, um, but, Edith thinks the same way Edward does, and Bo thinks the same way Bella does, and they there are little things different about them, but they're really, they're not totally, hmm. I mean, they are their own characters, but they are the same people. Hard to explain, sorry. Creative process. Um, Patricia and Kayla and Brooke and a lot of, a lot of people <laughs> um, would like to know, this has been a hot topic the past couple of days, are you planning on writing any more books telling the story after Breaking Dawn? Okay. And I need to answer this carefully because I've <laughs> seen how this has been picked up um, as there are two more books in the saga, <laughs> which yes, probably. I mean, the way I write, it could be three. I think that the, I'm pretty sure what okay. the next one is. The other one might be too long. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but we're talking the time scale that we're talking for Midnight Sun. <laughs> this is not something that's coming out next year or the year after, or probably even the year after, or maybe the year after that. Like <laughs> there are other stories I want to do. I want to create some mythologies that have nothing to do with vampires and just new rules, new maps, all of the, the fun process where you just get to make a new world. That's my favorite part. Good answer. Um, this this one's a little of a, bit of a downer. I think most people have seen this, but remember, in a few years, there'll be a few many years, there'll be more Twilight stuff. Um, would, do you plan to rewrite the rest of the series from Edward's point of view? This is from Cynthia and Christy and many other people. All right. Um, yeah, it is a bummer because I'm not, and I know there are people that um, flush with excitement of getting Midnight Sun are like, let's keep going. Um, but Midnight Sun obviously has been 
a difficult, arduous process for me, um, a very, very slow process. It has slowed down a lot of other things that I want to do because this was always the big hurdle to get over. Um, and also, right, the, the headspace I have to be in to write Edward is not always joyful. It's mostly pretty negative. Um, and New Moon would just be the worst. I, I, I like myself too much to put myself <laughs> through that. Like, I need my mental... By the way, me space too. To be happier. He's so sad, and I can't have well, another midnight. And I mean, Twilight's one thing, but New Moon. Yeah, I know. Ah, no, I, I can't do that. I can't have another heartbreak like the the months, the chapter oh, months. Sorry, I'll never recover from that. Thanks. <laughs> Still in lots of therapy. Um, let's see. This is from Macy. She, uh, lots of people are asking. Um, about whether this could be turned in Midnight Sun could be turned into something like a series, a bingeable series on Netflix or a movie, something similar. How do you feel about that? Cautiously optimistic, <laughs> mostly cautious, less optimistic. Um, I there part, there's part of me that would love to see that, and I do think it would be a limited series. I don't. I think as a movie, you'd end up just losing so much. I mean, movies are very limited. Um, you can't. Just do everything that you want to do. You have to be always conscious. Every page is a minute, and you just have to keep cutting and cutting. And that's a that's a difficult compromise. You're like, oh, like particularly. I remember when we were doing the host, and like I lost whole character arcs of people that I was invested in. And, but obviously, the book was enormous. Um, and now, as TV's become such a viable way to, you know tell a story. It seems like the right way to go. And so that's what I'd want to do with this. Um, the other thing that I have kicked around is the idea of not doing live action just because uh, with the other movies, everyone did their best and the special effects did their best, but you know, they're human actors and they look like human actors. And they haven't been able to find vamp real no, vampires. No yet. vampire actors yet. Um, and I, I'd love to see it look more like it did in my head where they're a lot more distinct, the vampires and the humans. Um, and so that would be, that'd be cool. Having, we were we had talked about before that um into the spider verse was a real you're just looking at what it's possible to do the creativity and the art and the attention to detail um that movie was genius and it's like look at what you can do with animation you can do amazing things and so that was that's more what i would want to see whether that can happen realistically i don't know good answer um, Amelia and Jojo, which I'm just now realizing, Jojo, I hope that's not my niece, Jojo, who's too young to be <laughs> on Facebook. Uh, which part of the books was your favorite to write? Her favorite part, Amelia's favorite part, um, was a scene with Alice running errands to cover their tracks. Oh, that's nice. I had a lot of fun with that chapter, but I actually considered not including it. Yep. It's, I, I had a lot, like, the way that they had to work to make that, um, whole situation turn into something less criminal. <laughs> you know, they they had to have some pretty convincing evidence and it was very complex. Um, and Bella knows nothing about it. She's heard the barest, tiniest things about what happened to make this not look like an attempted murder. Um, and, and I wanted to get the details because I knew how it happened, but it felt very exposition heavy. Um, and so doing it in the past looking to the future of how it's going to go down and getting to see Alice's process of how, because we see her generally just knowing the right thing to do and say at whatever time, but like how she does that, I, th I thought was really interesting, but I wasn't sure if everybody else would. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, I liked all the chapters where Bella wasn't present, which sounds so cruel. <laughs> it's not that I don't love Bella. It's that Every time she's there, she has already cataloged every word spoken, every action, especially anything Edward does, because she's, you know, obsessed and staring at him all the time. And so then I can't do anything new. It just has to be what Bella said. Um, so I liked it when I could create new things. And I think the fastest chapter I wrote was the car chase scene through Phoenix, because it would just, I mean, chapter is a tempo and writing it, it was there and just, you know, I did had to go back and do some things. My my car people, <laughs> one of which is my 18 year old son, uh, went through and made sure I had was saying things correctly. Had to do a little. It's nice that you have research. That. It is nice. Um, you sort of answered Eric's question, which is, which chapter do you find the most difficult to write in Midnight Sun? Well, I mean that's we the know. broad thing. <laughs> Bella makes it difficult. Um, 
But the hardest one was the meadow because not only is the entire chapter, you know, mapped out where she's watching everything he says and does. There's a lot of talking, um, so much talking. And a lot of it's from Edward. You'll notice I glossed over some things instead of doing all the dialogue because it was it was very heavy. Um, and and that was, I mean, that one took me forever. Oh, that chapter took forever. The, the best part was the beginning of the chapter with the scene where he walks into the meadow, which I had previously done a version of in um, Life and Death. Uh, because I'd always known that scene was there. And when I was writing Twilight, um, I started from the meadow scene kind of into where chapter 12, 12 or 13, I don't remember. I think it's 13. Um, I'm, no, I don't have that in here. <laughs> oh. um, sorry, we have books here, but not that, not that book. Um, and wrote to the end. And then I wrote the beginning and the, the 12th chapter, I think, ended at the ending part. Like this is where the chapter had to end. It has that rising action, it's ready to go but then it didn't fit. And I didn't want to do a little three page chapter that then messed up how I began. <laughs> and I, I figured I'd get called on it. Like some editor was going to say, what happened right here? And no one did. And so I'm like, well, maybe I don't need it. But then later I wanted it. So I did like writing that. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Anna. Why did you remove the line from the original, from the leaked, the leak, leaked draft? I'm wretchedly in love with you. Um, okay. That was my own personal take on the line. Thank you. You're welcome. Megan Hibbett. Um, so this is why you don't like having rough drafts online. <laughs> Wait. Uh, because then everyone, I when I'm editing a, a manuscript, you wouldn't believe how many changes and lines get pulled and new things get added in and so many things get switched around. And that's a natural part of the process. Um, I don't remember specifically that line. It might have been something the editor said maybe a little too melodramatic, do you think? I get that sometimes. Um, no. Melodrama. Uh, or maybe it was something that just, sometimes when I'm reading, there'll be a line that I'll just stick on and it will stop my eyes and I'll always just kind of pause there like, huh, that doesn't land exactly right. I'm not hearing it right. So for one of those reasons, it was one of the many things I pulled and then other things took their places or didn't, nothing took their places. I did a whole run where it's just like, I'm gonna pull out every sentence that bumps me and see if I, it still works. And generally it does. Um, so, you know, just, just that's part of the draft to polished, finished copy version. That's how it works. Yeah. Um, Deborah would like to know, uh, she noticed that several songs from the Midnight Sun playlist are referenced in the book. Is The Night We Met by Lord Huron, my personal favorite. <laughs> but not the reason why this question is in here, but still my personal favorite. Um, is that the song they dance to at prom? No. Um, that is more of a post-dance capture. Edward has a lot of different emotions at the end there. You know, he's at the prom with her and she looks beautiful and they're having a moment. Meanwhile, he's thinking, is this the last time I ever dance with her? Um, and so that was kind of the the post dancing. And when they're outside, there's a couple of songs that all hit different emotional responses in him. Um, but the song that I always hear for them dancing is um, spiritualized, ladies and gentlemen, with floating in space. It's a waltz if you listen to it. And I can just, and it's it's a slow waltz and it just fits how they would move. And uh, then of course, you know, kind of like the, the I can't help falling in love with you idea because he kind of wishes he could, <laughs> you know, he's looking a lot of yeah. misery coming up because yeah. he can't not be in love with her. So it fit really well for me. Um, Emily would like to know what the theme song of your life is while we're talking about songs. It depends <sighs> on the day. It depends. I mean, it depends on, on the, the hour, the minute we were, <laughs> We were recently stuck in like an hour long traffic jam. And as we're sitting there moaning about it, like every <laughs> song that came on was this like depressing negative song. We're like, it's a, the music, here's that sitting else. So it, I mean, it completely and totally depends. Every minute is a different song with me. So I can't really answer that. Um, there's, it is at all. there's some magic to the playlist, right? That mm -hmm. like when I remember when we were on, when we were filming Breaking Dawn, and it was, um, I don't want to say miserable. It was cold. It was very cold. It was very wet. Yeah. <laughs> and Our very clothes were days. getting mildewy. It didn't matter how often you washed and dried them. It we just... were 
driving yeah. driving to set every the crack of in dawn the mud everywhere. yeah in the mud and uh this this playlist that just random the randomized plays that kept coming out yeah. all of these songs like it's gonna be okay you're gonna get through this <laughs> it's a magic playlist it just plays a lot of okay go a lot of okay go that that for that period of time anyway um, Ashley would like to know how was Jasper able to control himself while Bella was hurt in the ballet studio? All right. So it probably seems a little at odds with Jasper freaking out over a paper cut in the next time, the next time we see him in new moon, the, it's all about mental preparation. Like he goes in knowing what they're going into. I mean, he doesn't know he's not seeing what Alice is seeing like Edward is, but he had, knows there's a very good chance Bella's already dead. Um, he also is in very much in that moment, emotionally aware of where Edward's at, which isn't a very good place. Um, so he never breathes. He doesn't ever let himself smell the scent of her blood because it probably would have overwhelmed him. So he goes in there, cut off from all smell. Um, and the whole next scene all the way until they get Bella to the hospital and probably even after that, until he gets into a new car and it's not going to burn him, he does not breathe in through his nose or mouth. He's just not going to do that. Now with the paper cut, totally unexpected. He is not geared up for anything. He's at home. He's relaxed. And just that minding his own business, minding his own business. And just that little whiff of blood is, was enough to really overwhelm him. I have a question. Okay. This is a Megan question. You may not answer it because like, not because you, if it's not written, if, it, if you don't need it, you don't write it. But, right. um, after the after everything that happened where, with Bella's to hospital and every does he get the heck out of town and like go eat or well like, I mean, take a we, mental break? We know what he did because Alice sees it. He stays with them, they do the shopping that they have to do, and he gets in the car and drives. Yes, I'm sure he stopped to drink on the way home, but he also wasn't incredibly thirsty. Okay, I it just, would have been difficult. Okay. If he had been. Just Megan curious. has a thing for Jasper. I mean, who doesn't? When uh, this is from Jess, when in the writing of Midnight Sun did you happen upon the Persephone's Hades uh, connection with Edward and Bella? All right, so that wasn't in the first um, part of the draft that was online. I had not um, gotten there yet, and that's one of those things. This is a good example mm -hmm. of how I was always working on Midnight Sun, even when I wasn't like engrossed in it. Um, I remember I was thinking about the the scene in Port Angeles where they're eating, she's eating her mushroom ravioli. And, you know, so the, the pictures are always there in my head. And sometimes I think about them, you know, showers are a good time for a lot of thought. And just what would he be thinking in that moment? I'd already written that scene, but, you know, I was still going over it. And I had that, that sense of, you know, him seeing himself in the role of Hades and, and the idea of little, the little things he's doing tying her to his his life and all of the darkness there. Um, and so I made wrote a post-it note, <laughs> put it on my bedside table. And the next time I sat down at the computer, I would pull them and kind of go back in. And then once I'd added that in, it felt very true to the character. And so I kind of it wove throughout from then on. Uh, sort of tying to that a little bit, this question is from Anna, who I'm personally upset with because she put all of these names into one question. Why is the title page a picture of Psyche and Eros and not Persephone and Hades? Got it. Yes. So when we were coming up with the cover, um, we focused on that first, but as before we had done the shoot for it um, and we kind of had a sense of, of a couple of different directions we were going to go, but it was going to be a pomegranate. And we knew it was going to be black and dark red and, you know, blood imagery kind of in there. Um, and it's a harder image. It's, it's darker. It doesn't feel like, oh, happy love story. Um, so I wanted the, the signature page to be more of the love story, um, more uplifting, like you would romantic. Um, and there aren't statues like that of Persephone and Hades. I like the idea. Of, <laughs> I like the idea of going with a statue because Bella always compares him, you know, to marble and, and, and he knows that he, you know, the stoneness of him, he's very aware of in the book. And it's such a soft image, you know, and just that almost kiss. It's beautiful. Um, so it just fit, even though it didn't bring back and we already had pomegranates. 
So we're good on Persephone and Hades. We've covered that. This was this was to have a soft romantic feel on the inside. Um, it was a hard. It was hard to get permission for that photo too. It was amazingly like hard. Like second. I didn't. We didn't know if we were going to have to go with like another forest picture. We had some backups picked out. Um, but yeah, we almost didn't get permission for that. It's harder than you would think. Um, Emily would like to know what is the connection between the chapter names in Twilight and Midnight Sun. So as I was going through this process, I, when I started, I just had the same chapter titles and then I would um, do Edward's version of that chapter. But then there became like extra, extra chapters started sneaking in and they got their own names. And then I was, I was looking at things and saying, this chapter heading, some of them fit perfectly. You know, this is what is, is happening. Like let's, but then there's something like phenomenon where for Bella, this is something unexplainable, magical, I guess. Uh -huh terrifying a little bit, but like, it's something so out of the ordinary. And while yes, it is an out of the ordinary day for him, it's not magical or like, how did this happen? Or where's the powers coming from? Like he knows what he can do. For him, it's like a really, really stupid decision or a really great one, but either way, he's in a lot of trouble. Um, and so risk just seemed like a way better title for that one. And, and so I had that process with a couple and there were some that even when we were, I was looking at the, the, What's the, I don't know how to explain it. So they they put every, they typeset everything and I, I get images of how it's going to look on the page. And even then in the, on the table of contents, I made changes at the last minute where I was like, I don't know, yeah. maybe that one's not quite right. So some of them were, have been there different the whole time and some were last minute, like this doesn't feel the right. same. Like the Cullens, that was a last minute one where I'd always just kind of skipped over it with my eyes and as I'm looking at it, typeset looking professional I'm like but why would he think of it that way it's yeah. home it's home is what that chapter is yeah that kind of thing um that's sweet i even thought of that <laughs> well because i don't think it's always learning new things about my convoluted brain <laughs> well i had i i read it so early on that i, I haven't read like a the book yeah. part of it and i haven't either I, I can't read it when it's in a book form because i want to make changes yeah too late yeah um you sort of touched on this a little bit. This is from Ashley. Whose headspace do you enjoy exploring most, Edward or Bella? Bella, hands down. Um, when Bella's telling the story, it is 90% about falling in love and just with the most beautiful person in the world. And it's, ah, uh, you know. <laughs> and with Edward's side, it's all about, I'm a horrible person. Why am I doing this? I'm ruining her life. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot of guilt and suffering, and I have to feel all of that. So I would much rather be in the headspace of someone who's falling in love. For sure. And not feeling horrible about it. Yep. Uh, I agree. Uh, this is the part where I have to try and pronounce people's Twitter handles, so forgive <laughs> me. Uh, at Not So Little Mermaid. <laughs> I think that's what it is. Uh, have Did the film adaptations affect how you visualize your characters when you're writing? It's a hard question because it's a yes and a no. Um, mostly it was a no. And I, I felt like I was holding on to it really well um, through the first couple movies because they were so distinct and they don't look, I mean, they look great and probably some of them a lot more attractive <laughs> than the actual characters, but, um, but they looked like the actors to me. They didn't look like the characters to me. Um, but then after we'd been working on it so much, it wasn't so much the movies as it is the scripts because I was living in the scripts a lot. And every day we're looking at the script and we're tweaking words and, and it did get in my head. Um, it made it hard. That's one of the reasons why Midnight Sun was delayed so many times because I just wasn't, it was, it was like smoke in my head where it was just kind of confusing and, and darkened things. Sounds so, it's so hard to try and describe things that go on inside your head. Um, Especially when you're sense. a little bit crazy. Uh, <laughs> no, it makes sense because even from the outside of it, being so involved in the movies, but also being so involved in the books, sometimes, and she will dig me for it every time, I will confuse the timeline or lines or, When she know. quotes back to me lines that she thinks are in the book and they're really in the well, movie. Well, I don't always think mm. they're... I, <laughs> mm, not my favorite. Listen, um, but uh, yeah, so it did. It slowed me down. And then uh, life and death was like the fresh air that blew all the smoke out and like, okay, there you are. There Forks is, it's yeah. back. Um, Jessica would like to know, are you a great cook like Bella or an unpredictable <laughs> cook like Renee? That's a um, I'm a boring cook. I'm not a great cook. I don't enjoy cooking. 
Um, and I'm lucky enough to live with three really great chefs. Two of my sons and my husband are both really good and they like to cook. They like trying new things and the adventure of it all, um, which lets me right off. The hook. <laughs> I used to be the primary cook when my kids were young. Uh, and I just, it just got to a point where I was making something for the kids, something for my husband and something entirely separate from myself. And I just was done. Yeah. Like I couldn't face it anymore. And so I'm like, you know what? We're eating out every single night. And then when my husband got sick of eating out every single night, he started cooking and then discovered this system. amazing talent. So it was great. Deborah would like to know when, where, and why. We don't have time for you to go into too many specifics. <laughs> was Edward underwater for multiple days? All right. So this is one of those things that I don't want to like define too specifically because I like to save everything until I actually need it in a book. But basically, um, if they're in twilight, they have to travel in by commercial air, uh, which is something they they need to manage very carefully. Um, it works. It, you know, Edward's doing something. Edward and Carlisle and Emmett, they're they're taking risks they shouldn't. Like it's very dangerous to get on a plane in the middle of the day and fly someplace sunny where you might not be able to stay in the shade all the time. Yeah. So they tend to avoid that unless they have no choice. Like Alice getting to Italy, she had to be in a hurry. So we see them flying a lot because they're in these extreme circumstances. Like the honeymoon, they could plan that out very well so that they would, Edward knew he would never be in danger. But you know, planes get delayed. There's, you gotta be careful. Um, yeah. So generally they would just swim. And you could swim along the surface, but why would you? All the, yeah. You don't have to breathe. You can expel all the air and not worry about pressure, and you can see everything. This is part of my fantasy of being able to, like, I love the ocean. I, I don't do great with scuba diving because, and I was told this wasn't possible, <laughs> you can get seasick underwater. Absolutely you can. Oh, and, uh, yeah, if you ever want to read about getting seasick and with scuba gear, not fun. Um, so I can't do that. That's, But I want to be down there exploring the ocean. I want to be Jacques Cousteau. And it kills me that my motion sickness is so bad I can't even ride in a boat. So it's this true. is part of the fantasy, not having to sleep, being able to be underwater and see all this stuff. Good answer. Makai would like, I'm going to do a, a little bit of a speed round here for a few of these. Okay. Um, Makai would like to know, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Do you have a favorite couple of the Cullens? Um, okay, so I don't do favorites because I love them all. Um, I probably my least favorite is Emmett and Rosalie because I love Emmett, but I agree with Edward that she's more trouble than a pretty face is worth. Um, but you know, Emmett, I mean, uh, Carlo and Esme are like so perfect, maybe a little too perfect. Alice and, and Jasper is really great because there's so many mystical elements to their relationship. But then you also have Edward and Bella, which is the reason why we're all here was their love story. So how do you pick? I don't. I do, Alice and Jasper. Uh, no. Wait, hold on. So the next part is if he hadn't met Bella, but he joined the Volturi. Um, no, because he is almost as bonded to Carlisle as, as he is to Bella. Carlisle is so incredibly important to him. He would never leave. Now they might've come after him, but they didn't really know about Edward. So without him going to Italy, they would have never yeah. come after him. Um, my favorite couple is Edith and Bob. Uh, <laughs> fight me on it. I know all of you want to. Juliana would like to know which character in the series would you like to meet in real life? Uh, I'm not going to kill you. Yeah. The, <laughs> I, I don't really want to meet the vampires. Um, I mean, I guess Alice, right? She's just always been the best friend that everybody would want, right? So it'd be great to ask her a few questions about the future. So this is from Courtney. Um, which character's backstory or human life did you find most interesting to write about? Um, you know what? All of them were interesting. I I tried not to give any of them a boring backstory, and I kind of tried to scatter it over different um, time periods and kind of different and, and very different lifestyles that people were were in. Um, Alice's was a a great one just because the visions and how it tied in and her memory loss and all of that was a lot of fun. But Rosalie's was darker, but also still fun to write. Speaking a couple of Alice questions here. She's a, she's okay. a favorite. Uh, Melissa wants to know what were Alice's thoughts when she saw what was on the video camera? 
And did she eventually remember what was what you had written in the guide about her or did she learn about herself through other means? Um, no, she never remembers. Um, she hears about it. And obviously that's like to, to realize, I mean, can you imagine if you have no memory of something and someone says, oh, I know you from this. Um, but her intrigue with her past and knowing that, you know, she was in an asylum and, and to start into that that research work is so overshadowed in that moment because she knows what Edward's going to feel when he sees it. And she wishes she could not let him see it, but she knows what happens if she destroys it. <laughs> so it's mostly at that moment, it's mostly just about suffering for Edward. She's a good egg. Um, and Ellen would like to know, and a lot of other people had sort of similar questions, but specifically, um, what is Alice Cullis? Alice Cullen's full story, we have show and tell. Prop time. <laughs> so this is the guide. Um, I've got all of the backstories as much as I intend to fill them out in the guide. Um, I don't want to write in the past anymore. I'm planning to just write forward in the future. But so I think there's enough to get a sense of where they came from. And then it kind of fits in. You get pieces throughout the novels. But um, the guide is is the definitive Alice's past. Oh, and there's and. a there's a movie version. Yeah, there's a movie version of a couple of the ba of the backstories from the guide. Um, a handful of years ago, we did something called Storytellers. I think it was New Voices of the Twilight Saga. We did with Lionsgate, Women in Film, uh, Tongle, Volvo. They were all people. a lot of people. Um, and you can find them all on YouTube. There are two Alice stories. Um, and the winning story. Um, yeah, the two, um, the Spear sisters yes. directed it, and yeah, the it was Mary Alice Brandon really, file. really well done. And it, it's a great look at Alice's history. Yeah, lots of questions answered for you there. Uh, Kayla would like to know what happened to the newborns who escaped before the battle and eclipse. So um, there's Shelley and Steve, who we just know people thought got fried, but actually figured out we're not hanging out around here anymore <laughs> and took off together. And they're just kind of living the the nomad life, a lot like um, Charlotte and Peter would be kind of a similar life that they're they're headed for. Um, and then you have Fred. And Fred. When I and he's the the only other one that bailed in time to survive. Um, and he will make a reappearance at some point in the ongoing He's story when I get to it. <laughs> um, Tiffany would like to know um, more about the painting that Edward mentions in the meadow. Is it a real painting? It's not. Um, I did look at, I was, I was kind of hoping to find something real. So I looked at a lot of images, but uh didn't wasn't exactly the one I was looking for. And so I just, in my head, I know exactly what it looks like. I painted one in my head. Now my hands don't have the same skill. So <laughs> I did not make it, but um, it's just something that exists only here. Uh, Andrea would like to know, is there a reason why, <laughs> this one makes me laugh, is there a reason why the prom, which is held in the gym in Twilight, <laughs> moved to the cafeteria in Midnight Sun? <laughs> Midnight Sun? Well, that's a mistake. Um, <laughs> And it's crazy to me because we had so many eyes on that, including my eyes. And I can tell you where the mistake originates. Um, I kind of had pictured uh, the general setup um, for Forks High School is similar to the um, floor plan of my middle school because that was about the right number of people that my middle school was about the same size as, as that high school. So I just sort of had, and that's why the buildings are separate because that's how I had I pictured it like that floor plan, um, which isn't the way they do things in the Pacific Northwest because it <laughs> rains a lot here. Um, and at my middle school, the cafeteria and the gym were the same building. Um, so some readers had discovered that. Uh, editors in Brazil actually are like, what's the deal? And it was too late to change it. Um, so I went back and looked at it and they never go from the gym to the cafeteria. Yeah. No one ever, sits, it's never clear that they're not the same place. So mistake, guys. We're going to go with that, though. They could be the same place. <laughs> could be the same place. No reason for them not to be. Um, v, oh, this is V. Uh, v plays Alice in the Olympic Coven. Oh, awesome. I love those guys. Uh, 
you should go over to their Instagram page. They did a really fun, very beautiful trivia contest leading up to Midnight Sun coming out. It was great. Um, she wants to know, do you ever peek at fan art or cosplay centered around the Twilight universe? Um, I I wouldn't know where to go searching for it, but I see it. It comes up on like Pinterest and mm. and uh, I and the uh, and method they they'll show me stuff that people do. I love cosplay. Like that's that's my jam. So I, I love that. It's so cute. And then the fan art as well, because sometimes people just really channel <laughs> my brain, which is an awesome thing to see. Somebody had asked um, about your Stephanie. They called it Octo Stephanie on your website <laughs> and what all the little figures mean. Um, um, in your hair, some of them are. Well, it's not my hair. It's the it's the wow. Octo woman's hair. Octo but hair. She's so to be a kind of representation of what my brain is like, where I have all these tentacles with so many stories and pieces, and doesn't it's not cohesive. Yeah. it's just all there. What about the help? Like just a few of them. Teacup. Teacup was Austin Land. The syringe. The syringe is the chemist. There's a little uh, a knife um, that is. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Is it Athame? Is it a Thame? Somebody will have to correct me. But from um, Anna Dressed in Blood, which we've been working on. Uh, the helmet. So the helmet um, is from a story that's not written yet. Ooh, yeah. It's one that doesn't exist in reality, only a few chapters on my computer. But that was one. You, I can tell when I look at that image, it's very specific of what I was doing at that time. <laughs> and if I did it today, there'd probably, maybe I'll redo we do it an update. and put more items in there. Um, do you have a favorite fan moment that you've seen since Midnight Sun has come out? Uh, so when I did my acknowledgments and I was trying to find a way to really thank people, you know, it's the acknowledgments are, are cold when it comes down to it. You know, it's just not enough. And, and I came up with the idea of, of letting people write their name in the book because they belong there. Um, and so I was really excited to see that. And I've seen a couple people's pictures of them writing in, in the book. And uh, my one of my favorites was, um, so Eric Feig, who uh, was the head of Summit Films back when we started doing Twilight movies and now has his own production company. Um, he And we've, we've been close for all of these years. And he sent me a picture of his name written in there and it was so cute. Um, yeah, we see a few fans having, yeah, doing it it's, I, I love seeing that. Uh, what's your, the favorite book you've ever written? Um, Probably the host. Um, yeah. I I feel like that might be some of my best work, but uh, I hope I can write something better. <laughs> Speaking of the host and favorite books, uh, what's up with the host, and are you going to finish it? That's okay, the host is finished. Um, well, sorry, the series. The series. Uh, I mean, the nice thing about the host is it ended at a an ending. It's not a cliffhanger, so I don't feel as much pressure. I would like to, I know, the whole problem is that I know the sequel too well. I know every single thing that happens and most of the lines spoken. And that is a real problem for me <laughs> because I it's the same thing as, as doing Midnight Sun where you're kind of locked in. And if I'm not able to create while I'm writing, it becomes a really laborious process. And uh, so I haven't touched it in a long time. Uh, I'd love to have it finished. I'm not too keen on the process of making that happen. I, like I was saying before, I want to create new rules, new worlds. Um, yeah. And so I need a, a palate cleanser before I can get back to anything that I've already done. Um, there were a lot of questions about your daily writing routine. Um, so we're going to loop because we're nearing the end of our time here. So Morgan asked specifically what your what your daily writing routine is, but I would expand that to, you know, general writing routine or yeah. And also writing advice. Okay. Um, so generally, uh, I don't have like a daily writing routine. I, when I re am really writing, I go under, so I have my normal life routine. Um, and then when I'm like editing and stuff, I can do normal life, but when I'm writing, writing, I don't do anything else. I usually start writing around, seven or eight at night and then I write through until three or four in the morning and then I sleep and then I eat and wash clothes or whatever else I have to do to survive and uh, go back to writing. I'm not able to like socialize or be a great mom which is easier now because my boys are grown up so they don't even need me. Um, you know it's just it's my husband's a very self-sufficient and independent man which is good because at times I don't live in the same house with him um, because I'm just not here. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's it, that's how I write, and it's not the easiest form or the most life friendly form. So I'm not sure I would recommend it. Um, if you can be one of those people that writes like during working hours and can stop and go about your life like nothing's happened, mm -hmm. congratulations, you win the lottery. Um, for writing advice, what I think is most important is to write. A lot of people have worry so much about the next steps and how do I get published and what about this and what are people writing that's going to sell and all of that, put it away. Um, yeah. Just write. Write a story that you're excited to come back to. Write a story that you want to see what happens. Write a story that when you come back to get back in and write again, you want to read through the whole thing because you're excited about it. If you're not excited by your own story, then maybe that's not the story because you should feel super compelled, I think. That's good advice. Uh, what books are you reading right now that you could recommend to viewers? Well, the last thing that I really just ripped through was Martha Wells' Murderbot Diaries. The first one's called All Systems Red. They're very short, fast. If you're looking for something to just pull you out of reality, it's a great one. And right now I'm reading Justina Ireland's Deathless Divide, um, which is uh, not, I mean, I don't want to say, it's not as much fun. It's about zombies and slavery and it's it's rough, but it's really good. So depends on your mood. If you want to read about a murder bot who has a lot of social anxiety <laughs> and you want to laugh a lot, go with Martha Wells. Okay. If you are like me who has not been able to read, I haven't been able to get into anything new during life since March. What are your comfort reads? Um, your my go-to. My go-to is Attachments by Rainbow Rowell. And I think it's funny because I feel like it should be some other world, right? A real escape. But I just need a cozy little love story with characters that I already love. That's that's my comfort zone. And yours is Rainbow, too. Yours fan is Fangirl. Girl. Or Lainey Taylor. Lainey Taylor is a good great. one. Anything Lainey Taylor. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question. Oh, we're here. We're here. Um, how do you feel about the response from the fans, new and old, since the book came out? It's been the most overwhelming and unexpected thing. I mean, yeah. it's like I have not been able to finish and I has slowed me down and I've gone away into quiet and not been a thing. And I really felt like, you know, people have moved on with their lives and, and nobody cared anymore. And I knew there were some people that were, because she would, she would tell me that she'd read things about people who still had Midnight Sun. I'm like, well, it's probably like two people that are doing all it's of that. It's more than two people. but It was more than two people. And I feel like oddly forgiven. <laughs> like, you know, I, I didn't I didn't get it done. And I, I wished I had. And I wanted to have it out there. And, and I just, it was too late. And then it wasn't. And everybody was so great. And like genuinely excited and ready to welcome me back with open arms and, and not say, oh, you were awful. <laughs> they were nice. I, you know, but my fans have always been the nicest people in the world. And I, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but it seems like people have been really nice to each other and good friends and supportive. Mm -hmm. And that means a ton to me. I'm so grateful that we don't have some toxic fandom of mean people, but that everybody's like genuinely nice people. I love that. I love you guys. You're amazing. And that they've stayed for this long, stayed oh friends God. for this long in like these groups. It's been, well, I mean, we are. Friend, friends who met through Twilight. That's so, true. And it's been a lot of years ago. And the Young Writers. And Well, I mean, that was second. That's true. It was we Twilight met through Paris. Twilight and then discovered everything else we had in common. That's true. There was a lot. Yep. All right, guys. So we're out of time, but thanks for listening to us ramble about books. Um, <laughs> it's always fun to talk about. And thank you, guys. Like I said, you're amazing. And I love you. And thanks, Barnes & Noble, for letting us have this space and for providing me with books my whole life. Yes. And also, um, they would like me to remind you that you can purchase this very shiny book. So shiny. Um, on Barnes & Noble. And, you know, Lainey Taylor, Rainbow Rowell, anybody Martha else? Wells. Martha Wells. Justine yeah. Ireland. Lots of things. Yeah. Lots of books. All right, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.